Hello, I'm Andrea Goodman, conductor of the Cantalina Chamber Choir here in the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts. On Talking Choral Music, I introduce you to people from the world of choral music, some well-known and others you should know about who are doing amazing things. Today's guests are four New York City professional singers who will share with us how to make a living in choral music. Nancy Wirch is a choral contractor, singer, and composer. Mary and Mukumurata have performed in almost every important concert for several decades, and Roosevelt Credit's career bridges Broadway, opera, and classical choral singing. Their stories are fascinating and inspirational to every singer trying to make it in the big city. Hi, everybody. Hello. And talking to talking choral music. Nancy, just uh, this is Nancy. And uh, Rue, may I call you Rue, even though it's Roosevelt? You're, yes, you're yes. known as Rue. Yes, thank yeah, you. Mary and Mukun there. Um, where are you talking from today, actually? Lawrence, Kansas. And how, how is it you're in Kansas? How did you? Uh, <laughs> we most retired people call the other here. way. <laughs> What's that? We retired here uh, almost two years now ago. And uh, I grew up in Kansas and went to school at KU and convinced him that Kansas was cheaper to retire to than that didn't staying in New York. That didn't take a lot of convincing. No, that's true. So I have, I have a lot of family here. And wonderful. Uh, so uh, I'm going to jump right in with some questions. First of all, Nancy, you're the contractor. You're one of just maybe a few, maybe two in the whole city. That's an amazing feat to be able to have elbowed your way in there. So can you tell us for uh, some of our singers who are listening from outside of the New York area, what does a choral contractor do and why is one necessary? And how did you get to be the one to do this? How important is a choral contractor? Well, I started out as a singer and um, I discovered early on that there are a, a lot of conductors and organizations that don't know singers. So I sang in a lot of groups that had some good singers and some bad singers. And I didn't like that because, you know, time is money in New York. You're paying everybody a lot of money to learn and do this concert. So I also didn't like sitting around and waiting for people to learn their music on this, you know, um, on the scene. So I actually went into contracting more because of what I wanted to have singing around me. I wanted to have really good singers and I didn't want to have people who couldn't cut it. And I knew the difference. And I started to have auditions so that I could, you know, make my roster bigger. Um, and little by little, I mean, I, I didn't do it actually because I said, oh, I need more money. Of course it did give me more money, but I really did it because of my, um, my own interest in wanting to sing in the best possible groups I could get into. And I found that a lot of the groups I was hired for were not solidly great, you know, and um, that's how I got started. Um, and then well, things must have changed when you started bringing good singers and now the conductors didn't have to audition the singers themselves. Is that a big part of this? They never, I, I don't think they ever did. I mean, oh. as far as I know, I mean, I'd, I had conductors hire, you know, atonal pieces you know, really hard atonal pieces and bring people in that just couldn't even got a clue of, of how to do that. Um, and I mean, I finally just said, you know what, I can find the right singers for you. You don't have to waste all this time because I mean, there you lose money if you have to spend time on singers who can't do read, you know. Mm. And I've through the years, I've looked for in my auditions, the finest singers I can find who are also fabulous musicians and can read anything. And I found a few. And of course, there are a lot of people who are very competent at reading um, and they can go in certain groups of mine. And I'm always, always, always listening to how this, how the different voices sound together, beautiful, you know, blend. Um, and I think the, the conductors and the organization don't know that either. So right. So you, do you change the roster depending on the repertoire or depending on the reading demands or how does that work? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, 
Um, you know, the New York Virtuoso Singers with Harold Rosenbaum have done atonal music for, you know, he loves it. So <laughs> the people that I hire for that little group have to have a particular kind of ear and ability to, to read just about anything. But there are also very beautiful other, you know, I mean, the like the Bard Festival with, you know, all kinds of romantic music that that requires a different kind of a voice. And certainly, I mean, all the people that get on my roster can read. If there's somebody with a beautiful voice that can't read at all, they just don't get there because I'm I'm known actually to, you know, to hire singers who can really cut it and make the most of the time that, you know, the rehearsal time, so. So uh, Nancy and Mukunda, I want to ask you, uh, we talked before we started recording that you hopped on to the choral scene in New York at a really good time. It seemed that uh, there were a lot of opportunities that were just starting to blossom. An experimental lab choir at Juilliard, I mean, think about that with Richard Westenberg, uh, starting to, to have conductors be able to actually work with a professional chorus. It's almost not fair, you know, to, to learn <laughs> on professionals. I mean, you guys can do it no matter what. I'm so, um, it, by the way, what's um, that? I'm still doing that, actually. James Bagwell has um, a conductor's chorus. You know, he teaches at the Bard School, Bard College, and he brings his conductors in to work with a group of professional singers on a regular basis. Up they at Bard? Work. No, they come into New York. Wow, okay. Meet with us. Yeah, so I'm still, I, I'm still doing that, actually. And That's I'm, wonderful. Yeah. So um, then the, in the early 80s, uh, aside from that there was, you know, the New York Philharmonic started to hire more singers. Um, mm -hmm. And then there were all the touring choirs too. Uh, you know, uh, I think the Cormier was still touring at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, there was uh, also, Roger Wagner was just uh, uh, touring a little bit less. But now Greg Smith, we all were touched by Greg Smith. Can you tell us something yes. about those early years? You, I remember um, there was, um, Nancy and uh, Ross Crowley were singing in the early days too, and they went on to sing at the Met and they did very well. Everybody did kind of well and, and managed to go on with a good career. Can you talk about that? Well, I can, mm -hmm. but I think Mary and Mook have got it. Yep. Yes. What, why yes. don't I start? Because um, I first met Greg Smith um, when he was the conductor of the Columbia University Glee Club. Wow. Right. And uh, that was really how I got started into singing. Um, uh, I hadn't really thought about singing as a career. I mean, I'd always been, had music in my life, but it wasn't something I'd really thought about. And on a whim during freshman orientation, I walked into, uh, you know, they were having auditions for the, the Glee Club. And on the, fl the flyer, it said, we don't care if you know how to sing or not. <laughs> so that's great. <laughs> I mean, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they said, you know, Greg will teach you. Don't worry. Uh, so I, I, I walked in and I, I auditioned. And to tell you how little I knew about what I was about to be doing, um, they were. Greg was doing his usual audition thing where he, you'd get up and you, you'd sing a scale, and then he put you in whatever section you were supposed to be in. This was an all male glee club, and. Um, I got up and he said, so are you a baritone, tenor, you know, what? And I said, uh, I, I don't know, what are most people? And he <laughs> said, most people are, most guys are baritones. And I said, oh, I'm probably a baritone then. <laughs> <laughs> and I sang one scale and he said, first tenor. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, really. <laughs> so, so that, and that was how it started with me. I sang with Greg in the in the Columbia Choir for uh, you know four actually five years and uh, that was really where I learned how to do everything that that uh, translated into my career later I learned how to think on my feet I learned how to sight read um, I learned how to be flexible and that I was think it people for me. should under yes I think people should understand though that um, it's not just because you're a tenor that you worked all these years, because there are tenors around in New York, believe it or not. Um, and so conductors do have their choice of tenors, but you yeah. seem to always be hired. As a matter of fact, 
I always wondered how someone who got on the roster, Nancy, of or you or anyone else in those early days, they're, they, they stayed on for years. And how did one uh, become, uh, get the opportunity to sing in professional choruses when all those other people were already doing it? So Mukun, can you talk about that, that you, you just always got the gig somehow? Um, yeah, and, and I know that um, a, a lot of the jobs I did for people like Nancy were because I had learned how to sight read. Mm -hmm. um, Greg Smith had a way of pulling you through something that you didn't think you knew at all. And, and so you just learned a confidence there, or actually you, you learned not to be afraid. <laughs> Because that, for me, sight reading was was that. If 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 you're afraid, oh, how am I going to do this? What am I going to do this? But I, I've always said that uh, when you're young, it's amazing the things you can accomplish because you just don't know any better. Yeah. And Mary, um, I I know you guys kind of come together, but it's not like you know you have to hire you because he's in the gig. By no. the way, I'm sorry to use a disrespectful term to some people might think gig is disrespectful, but gig is what we say for Beethoven 9. Gig is what we say for singing green sleeves at weddings. I mean, so yep. yeah, it's a gig. That's what we say. <laughs> so, so Mary, tell us now, um, you uh, have traveled a lot too with uh, not only touring with, uh, I with Greg, but- the Came to New York City and I got a church job right away. I went to Fifth Avenue Prez and my uh, church, conductor here in Lawrence. I was the section leader here, recommended me to Bill Whitehead. So I went up my first Sunday in New York and said, I want to sing for you. And he said, okay. And he hired me. So um, that started. And through that, I met other, other singers in that group and got a teacher and I was typing. I could type and that got me a job right, you know, right off the bat. But within two years, I had auditioned for Greg and got in the Greg Smith Singers. And I was in the, the regular group a year before Mokin. And we, then he joined and we toured, we went to Belgium and we went to Europe. And I know the group itself had gone to lots of different places. And then I've also toured with uh, Judy Klurman and with Harold uh, Rosenbaum. Mm. And I started out, I went to Salzburg for a summer uh, before I joined the Greg Smith Singers and, and performed pant roles there, which was really fun. But I think going back to Greg a little bit, I think what he really did was he could, he had the best ears and yeah. he could, you could be singing, all of you could be singing a different note and he would pick out one person and, and hum another pitch at them that was the pitch they were supposed to be doing. It was unbelievable. Right. And he, he did, he could take we literally could p get a piece that we were just given at intermission at Alice Dully Hall. <laughs> and he could teach it to us. And then on stage, he's humming the pitches at us because that's how on the fly it was. But it really did give you, I mean, I was thought of myself as a really good reader for the KU choir, but, and I was a good reader, but he really gave you that confidence and that ability to, to really listen to everybody around you, not just listen to yourself. So, yes. With Greg, uh, I know uh, we did some pieces by, uh, we recorded some pieces by Elliot Carter. Right. And um, and those were, you know, great fun. Those Which are- got to do subsequently with Harold and-, and That's the definitive know. recording of, of his, of Elliot Carter's pieces, the way you guys did it. It's just fabulous. Yes. So, and he was one of the composers in residence too in the early years. So Rue, um, let's talk about your experience, you have a lot of different kinds of things going on, uh, solo experience, and you shook your head with Verbier, so you must have been involved in that. Can you, you'd be a good person to ask, what was your favorite gig that you've had over the years, or a few favorite gigs? You know, uh, thank you for asking, and it's great to be here. Thanks for doing this for the community and uh, supporting live music, and because, you know, there's nothing like it, and it will come back. Um, so, yeah, this is... Uh, you know, um, I've had a lot of varied experiences in music, but, um, you know, there's, and I have a lot, you know, I just love the live, the live element. So there are many reasons that I love it, but, uh, I got to meet Nancy. Uh, you know, I found out about Nancy by accident because somebody, I was, um, needing a job after my Broadway show was head closed and they're like, you should go talk to this Nancy workforce and she's a contractor. And I was like, Ooh, what is that? You know? So that's how I got, 
audition and I went to her house and I auditioned to her. And then from there, it was been life changing. So she, uh, Nancy started contracting the uh, Collegiate Corral, uh, which is now Master Voices. Shout out to all of those if they're listening. And um, I was one of the first people that got to go experience Rear VA. And that was life changing because yes, we did get to sit under the baton of, um, of, uh, uh, Jimmy, you know, right off the back of, uh, I'm sorry, not Jimmy. Fine. The first thing we did was a very good wine. James. Right. He had been up all night and they, we couldn't find any dinner either, but we still had a rehearsal that <laughs> next day. <laughs> Airplane ears, we couldn't get in the hotel. They weren't ready for us. We were in the lobby. The whole thing was a mess. And going up to Verbier is up a, up a huge mountain and we were on a double decker bus and and we had no idea what we were getting into but the bus was actually bigger than the street so it would go slow and turn and every time we'd get to a curve and look like we were falling off the whole bus would be yeah so it was like a roller coaster right you know so that <laughs> amazing it really was because it was like switch back all the way up the mountain <laughs> right to the top we got off got into the gym and there was James Levine with the orchestra and we sang the very requiem. <laughs> right off the bat. And he and then and he's and the first thing he says to us is he's like, you know, there are many different forms of conducting. I'm not gonna make big gestures and blah blah blah. He's like, when I want you to crescendo, I'm going to do this. <laughs> and you do that. And you know, and there's a professional choir of 80 of us and we're just like you know, with the with the, with the orchestra of a hundred and something people. So there was a lot of people in there crammed in this room, first of all. And we're like, we can't even see that. And then he goes, that's right. So you just need to pay attention. And then the way he would address the orchestra was just unbelievable. So he got them all to play pianos like they were silver. And he got us to sing like we were like skating on a thin layer of ice above the water. It was stunning. And uh, it was life changing because we were like in a master class with James Levine, I call him Jimmy, the whole time. And uh, and every single nugget of information, we would just sit there and wait for him to say something else. And so by the time we got to that concert, he didn't even have to move his arms and that choir could sing completely silent on a piano and they could sing triple forte. It was unbelievable. So yeah, so I got baptized quickly um, with that group and we, it was just, we, we, that was one of the best times of my life. And I made some of my besties are still there in Switzerland. They're like, your choir's not coming. Why aren't you coming? You know? And so I still talk to them online. Coming this year. Yeah. Every, every summer. You might come this year. Yeah, year. There were people in Verbier looking for him, right? So oh. they would ask me, is, is Rue coming this year? They'd see me. Oh, I see. Oh, here. <laughs> or not, you know, they always wanted to see Rue. Everybody who ever meets Rue wants to. <laughs> so Rue, if you had to choose between Porgy and Bess. <laughs> Oh, oh come on now. And there's oh that's see, that's like apples and and I and suppose. Yeah, sure. Uh, I got to do the Porgy and Bess, uh, the the revival, well, the uh, the the um, premiere of Porgy and Bess with the Broadway company of the Broadway, the musical Porgy and Bess, not the opera. And um, so we had to get Porgy and Bess, which is over four hours long, into a under three hours long because Broadway shows can only have you know they they have to be a certain length. So I got to work with uh, with uh, Diane and um, Diane Paulus and all of her team, and we took that Porgy and Bess and we won the Tony for it. So that's all I can say is uh, there was a lot of people that were saying a lot of things about um, how dare you try to change Porgy and Bess. You know, the, the intention was never to change Porgy and Bess. Uh, the Gershwin Foundation had come to the directors and said, we want to do this and that and the other. And that's how that all started. So yeah, so I got to be on Broadway and we won the Tony. So I've been on the Tony's a couple of times. I was with Hell Prince and Showboat. And um, and now I sing at St. Ignatius Loyola, which is, you know, one of the best choirs in the city. So I just can't, uh, I'm just very thankful for my music career. Oh, that's that's great. And so you are all proof. You now you've done other things in addition to singing, uh, mostly connected with music, but you have made a living in music. So yes. uh, Nancy, the question for you is, what would you advise any young singer coming to New York today with a degree in voice if they want to start a professional career, what should they do? Well, first of all, I think they need to be as versatile as possible and willing to do lots of different kinds of music. Uh, and that sight reading is so important because when you get hired to do a job, you waste time if you can't just cut it, you know? I'm talking about choral singing. Um, 
But I also was thinking about myself, you know, when, when I first came to New York, that was 1979, but I wasn't sure what was going to happen and what I could do. So I had one friend who I'd gone to school with and I called him up. He was in New York and I knew he was doing kind of what I wanted to do. So I, I said, look, can, can you make a living doing this? You know, and he said, yeah. So I said, okay, um, give me some names and some phone numbers and I'm going to come and go for it. And he did. He gave me maybe nine or 10 different, you know, some choral contractors and some conductors and some church people. And I called them all up. There was no internet. I called them all up. Um, and I learned very quickly that you have to be able to say who you are and how good you are in about 30 seconds before they would hang up on you. But you know, <laughs> you have to learn to toot your own horn quickly in New York because they, people expect that of you, or at least they did at the time. They expect you to be very forward and very active pr promoting yourself. And I think that's, uh, again, you know, that you're saying about how you're, Greg Smith taught you to be fearless. You know, there's an aspect of that. You really have to be very forward and very sure and, you know, very positive. And if you're really, really good, I would say there's a place for you here. It, New York has been really wonderful to me. I've loved it. I've, I have no regrets. I've enjoyed everything I've done almost, you know, I, I've really had a wonderful career here. I certainly I don't think any of us are going to end up being rich from it, but we did make a living and we just enjoyed, you know, the whole process. It's so different and varied and, um, and it's a beautiful, really a beautiful life. If you have a little bit of Bohemian in you, if you want, <laughs> you know, if you yes. want, if you want the, the house and the yard and the picket fence, that's not probably going to be a part of it. But if it's, you know, adventure you want and all kinds of different kinds of music and challenge, it's all here. And I think it's at its absolute, I mean, I don't know about now, but during my career, and I mean, I'm not done yet, I'm still contracting, you know, I'm still writing music. Um, but I really have had a wonderful 40 years and I have no regrets. Yes, well, we'll, we'll be able to see uh, in the show notes about your a website and all your compositions and for one I can tell you that I I do them all the time and they're really uh, fabulous so uh, and everybody Absolutely. knows that right yeah <laughs> I think also that one should understand I was always questioning why isn't there more choral singing with big orchestras in the city well why uh, what's this thing with uh, you know hiring a, a volunteer choir as opposed to a professional choir and why why were orchestras so reluctant? And then someone told me, and this was the, in the early 80s, that it's cost some ridiculous figure of $100,000 to set up risers because that, those were <laughs> the union rates. So it's no wonder they didn't use choruses. But, um, you know, there they were enough. Like there was the visiting orchestras from outside, from Europe or wherever, they didn't have a choir with them. They would schedule a choral piece and, you know, there you would be uh, contracting for, for that. So there was, um, plenty of things in the offering here or there. So, and plus there are many of you who were um, enterprising that created your own work, your own gigs and did some other things. So Nancy and Mukund, it's finally, we have to wrap up even though I could talk to you all day. <laughs> was is there something you did to um, keep your income coming in, let's say, when uh, work was a little less uh, in the offing that, you know, because there wasn't so much of it around you? Well, what yes. did you do? I, I um, like many things in my my career, I fell into teaching. Um, there was a, a a colleague of mine who sat next to me in my temple choir, who uh, had a, a a teaching job in a community college in Patterson, New Jersey. And one day he turned to me and he said, "I have this teaching job. Can't do it anymore. You want to do it?" Um, Mary, I always thought it was funny because Mary has the educational degree, but I was the one who was teaching. But eventually she came on board at the same school because I was so busy doing things at New York City Opera one season that I just didn't have time. So she took all over my, took over all my students for a, for a semester. 
And then that went so well that they decided to add two sections. So yeah. we both ended up teaching. So Rue, oh, you good. seem to be very flexible too, that you can do a lot of different things. I understand you're also a choir director, so you get to use those chops at all in your work? Yeah, I conduct uh, choirs of Country Country uh, doing ACDA conventions and the, the MENC, and I do uh, the various, uh, you know, K through 12 and uh, college choirs as well. So it, you know, and then I'm a composer. I too am a published composer and I have a book of an, an anthology of spirituals out uh, because I believe that that education is important. And I don't, just because I look like I do, doesn't mean that, um, uh, you know, that I'm the only specialist doing spirituals. Cause I can tell you right now that Nancy puts a mean spin on her. <laughs> I, mean, oh, I, yes. I know, I know. Yeah. blessed assurance. What? Yep. Yeah. And then, and then you see Nancy and she's like, oh, hello. And you're like, no way. You mean, <laughs> it's unbelievable. And then in addition, I tell the students to, to drink lots of water, to take a few dance classes. If you can get in a, some kind of instrumental uh, piano class is always good. You need to be able to play your part and learn how to do your music quickly because that's part of the, the if you can't sight read it fast enough, find a way to play it on your flute, on your violin, whatever you play, just make sure you can learn your music because that's really important when you're here in Manhattan. Um, and then uh, also to supplement my income, you know, I found out there were voiceover opportunities because of, you know, because we're trained singers and they're like, and because we read languages. So they're like, you can speak Spanish. I'm like, not speak it, but we can read it and we can read German or whatever. So uh, voiceover people really like that. So that's another way to supplement your income. And then I got into big and tall modeling, you know, because we know how to wear a, a tuxedo. We know how to tie a bow tie. <laughs> Uh, just little <laughs> enjoy everything about yourself all those things that make you unique and embrace them and and do them well enough that people will pay you for them so yes. nancy in in closing then um you have done it all too I, I again have to mention your compositions because obviously blessed assurance is your most fa famous one and you have that adopted for different kinds of ensembles too and uh it's, it's a big hit, and I'm hoping that that supplements your income too, um, especially since a lot of school choirs do it also. Would you like to say something in closing that you would always wanted to say to an audience of future choral singers or uh, New York City freelancers who will be watching this? Oh, I don't know. Um, I just, you know, I've always loved choral music. I, I grew up in a German community that you know, in Wisconsin with, uh, there was a men's chorus and there's a women's chorus. And I, I went as a child and heard them sing their concerts twice a year. And I had a wonderful high school choir. I just don't think there's anything more joyous and wonderful than making music vocally together. Um, and I think that anybody who loves that is very blessed and should pursue it if at all possible in whatever way you know even if you're mm -hmm. in a small town get in a choir you know and really there there's nothing like it it's just a beautiful experience and you know artistically um you know it's just a joy to make music together and to blend those voices and to just make these gorgeous sounds together and to praise and to you know we're, we're just very fortunate to have that as a possibility in life and i would just say pursue it in whatever way you can great well thank you all for participating today uh, we learned a lot we learned it is possible to be creative and make a living and won't be um in a palace unless you have um, a significant <laughs> other who happens to already live in a palace, which is not a bad thing. Not not with you guys, of course, but uh, I mean, so what? And even have children, which I forgot to mention that. that yes, uh, we do. Yes, yes, it's it's possible to do. And so, unfortunately, well, both of them are very artistic. Did you say unfortunately? <laughs> of, well, yeah, I'm just kidding. One of them turned out to be a writer and the other one's an artist. So, so there right. you are. Not mine. Mine's a park ranger. Right. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> It's a good one. She she park ranges up around. I mean, all over Manhattan. But I see her up, up in my park, and I'm like, "What's that girl?" And, and the, other know, one, the other one, the other one lives in London, and I never see him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's being a parent. So, thank you again, uh, everybody, and um, well, I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. We Thanks. enjoyed it. Bye.
Bye. If you like this video, just click the button below to subscribe. And thanks for watching.